Oh, hi, Vern. Is this your piggy bank? Well, I was just going to use this spare change to get you a used car deal at Willett Toyota. They got all kind of used car deals at Willett, Vern. From $200 and up, domestics and imports, 69s to 85s. So put your spare change in a used car from Willett. Because, heck, Vern, transportation don't mean nothing to a pig. I wasn't really going to bust it. Oh, look what mean old Mr. Gravity did. There is truth in advertising, yes I swear, yes I swear Got new Nikes on my feet and beat out Sassoon in my hair I can sure use a Budweiser for the volume underwear There is truth in advertising, I swear Why would they lie to me when they love what they sell? Plus we all know that the liars have a special fire in hell On the television, radio, and in the magazine The advertising got to perpetuate the American dream And let it be, let it be Now I know that I don't need to buy Everything to try to sell me But so easily divided is a fool And his money There is truth in advertising Let it be Why would they lie to me When they love what they sell Plus we all know that the liars Got a special fire in hell On the television, radio And in the magazines The advertising got to perpetuate It's hard enough seeing a grading character in numerous advertisements over the years, so imagine how hard it would be to see them even more regularly. ABC tried this with the Cavemen TV series, but it failed spectacularly. And since then, there hasn't really been any other attempt to further prostitute a mascot for a wide audience beyond their initial created intention. Except there's one mascot who not only was more famous than the ads he was in, and not only made it on television, but became an actual film star. That mascot is Ernest P. Worrell. Ernest, portrayed by actor and comedian Jim Varney, was created in tandem by Varney and the Nashville agency Cardin and Cherry to be used primarily in various local television ad campaigns. In fact, he was so local that the only national products he ever wound up promoting were Coca-Cola, Czech cereal, and a place called Taco John's, which I can't believe is national considering I've never even heard of it. The format of these ads seldom strayed from their structure, often scripted to be comedic and rather fast paced. Ernest would appear at the door of an eternally silent, unwilling neighbor named Vern, and he would ramble endlessly, giving a favorable description of the product, closing with his signature phrase, know what I mean? Here's a fun fact. Ernest's middle name, the letter P, actually stands for power tools. Frankly, if my parents gave me a middle name like power tools, I too might be an insufferable shit. The ads were shot with a handheld camera at the Nashville area home of producers John Cherry III and Jerry Carden, beginning in 1980. As their clients increased, Varney would sometimes do upwards of 25 different versions of an ad in a single day. It's said that he had a photographic memory and would read through the script once, then insert various product names on different takes. His commercials and the character was, unsurprisingly, most impactful to children, who began to imitate his catchphrase pretty immediately. When Cardin and Cherry began receiving requests from major national companies to use the character, they were largely unable to come to any sort of agreement, mostly because of conflicts with exclusive rights local companies received when they had requested earnest commercials. So what did Cardin and Cherry do to counteract this? Why, they brought Ernest to various mass media, of course. In 1985, the horror film spoof Dr. Otto and the Riddle of the Gloom Beam, which, not gonna lie, sounds like a Troy McClure film, featured the first feature film appearance of Ernest, among many other numerous characters that Varney portrayed. The success of this movie brought forth a Saturday morning sketch comedy series titled, understandably, Hey Vern, It's Ernest, which won Varney a Daytime Emmy Award. All of this would have actually been forgivable, but 
this isn't what Ernest is remembered for. That would be the endless string of mostly direct-to-video features aimed primarily at children that he made. And they said Joe Camel was a bad influence. Between the years of 1987 and 1993, a series of five feature-length films starring Ernest were released, followed by four more direct-to-video features. All nine films were directed by either John Cherry or Coke Sam's, which sounds like the name of a drug-running cowboy. Unlike the show, these were not critically well-received, but they did manage to hit that ever-sought-after sweet spot of being produced on very low budgets while simultaneously being quite profitable. It began to seem like Ernest was unstoppable. In the role, Varney appeared in dozens of Cerritos Auto Square commercials for many years on Los Angeles area television stations, while also appearing in commercials for Autobahn Chrysler Center in Henderson, Kentucky, John Sullivan Auto Dealerships in Sacramento, California, Pontiac, Michigan-based electronics store ABC Warehouse, and the Oklahoma City-based Brahms Ice Cream and Dairy Store. In New Mexico, he appeared in commercials for Blake's Burger, while in Northern Virginia, he appeared in a series of commercials for Tyson's Toyota. In South Dakota, he appeared in commercials for Lewis Drugs. He also did commercials promoting Channel 2 News in Houston, Texas. But the strangest product Ernest was the spokesperson for had to be Purity Milk in the Southeast. He also, and I realize this is going to sound unreal, but I swear it's true, hosted the Happy New Year America special for CBS in the late 80s, while also briefly appearing on HBO's New Year special, which was co-hosted by goddamn Johnny Cash heading into 1985. If there's two people I never expected to see involved in the same production, it's Johnny Cash and fucking Ernest. But unlike all the other mascots in this show, Ernest is not only the only one to make a successful jump to feature film, but also to be more known for that than the advertising work that he was involved in. The Ernest movies were, to put it mildly, inescapable. They were on television all the time, and they littered the rental store's shelves in the kids' section. But more fascinating than that is the fact that most of his commercials were released on VHS tapes from Disney's Touchstone Pictures and Hollywood Pictures Home Video, respectively. Many are also available on DVD from Mill Creek and Image Entertainment. This is one of, if not the only instance that I'm aware of, where the character proved so popular that they sold copies of his commercials to people. They sold you advertising. If that isn't sleazy, I don't know what is. So if Ernest was that popular, that impossible to avoid, that financially viable, then what exactly led to the character's demise? Sadly, an actual demise. On February 10, 2000, two years after the last Ernest film in 1998, Jim Varney died. Varney actually had a fairly impressive career outside of the character of Ernest. He was a widely respected actor, and he also played the character of Jed Clampett in the film adaptation of the Beverly Hillbillies in 1993 and was the voice of Slinky Dog in the first two Toy Story films. Varney died of lung cancer in 2000, leaving behind two posthumous releases, one of which was the Disney film Atlantis, The Lost Empire, which has since gone on to become a respected cult classic in the animation industry. In fact, Varney's handprints are displayed at Disney itself, and the Walt Disneyland World Resort's Epcot Park featured Ernest in their Cranium Command attraction. It's easy to believe, really, that had Varney not died, Ernest would have kept going, there was likely no end in sight for the character, and while its eventual coolitization for the kids is justifiably unfortunate, it's probably what kept the character from really leaving the public eye more than anything. Children have a remarkable impact on the advertising world, and if something appeals to children, it's going to stick around for a very long time. To say the Ernest films were successful is putting it mildly. Ernest Goes to Camp, released in 1987, grossed $23.5 million at the U.S. box office on a $3.5 million production budget. 
while staying in the box office top five for its first three weeks of release. While the other films were not as successful, this fact made all the more clear by the last four of them being direct to video, it's somewhat unbelievable to think that a character created by an advertising agency and portrayed by a comedian would go on to have such an enormous success in another medium of entertainment altogether. There were actually seven Ernest films reported to be in development during 1990 alone, but of course, Barney's death complicated matters some. He died before completion of the 10th one, titled Ernest the Pirate, would have been slated for release in 2000. Yet in 2011, Sams said the film never even existed, so who really knows? The character was repeatedly parodied in numerous television shows, most notably The Simpsons, but also in shows like Family Guy and Beavis and Butthead. Other shows who referenced Ernest movies included ALF, Saved by the Bell, Mystery Science Theater 3000, The Nanny, How I Met Your Mother, and The Big Bang Theory. In fact, Ernest was recently spoofed by Arkansas-based spokesperson John Lee in commercials for Inglert Leaf Guard Gutters. Makes sense, considering Ernest was regularly portrayed as being a blue-collar type of guy. However, in Ernest's defense, a sentence I cannot believe I'm having to say with a straight face, perhaps the most damning thing related to the character was something that wasn't even the character's fault. In 2005, five years after Varney's death, the character returned in new commercials as a CGI cartoon created by animation company Face to Face and produced by the character's originators, Cardin and Cherry. This time around, he was voiced by John C. Hudgens, an advertising and broadcast producer from Little Rock, Arkansas. Perhaps not everyone feels this way, but to take a character so tied to the person who portrayed them and bastardize them in CGI years after the actor's death just feels kind of dirty to me. Sure, Cardin and Cherry actually created Ernest, and sure, they own the rights, but Ernest was made famous by Varney. The two are inextricably intertwined, and the mere fact that these ads presumably didn't last beyond 2005, nor can I find them anywhere, I think says all that needs to be said about it. So Varney may have left us, and Ernest may exist primarily as a relic more of children's entertainment than as an actual mascot now. But he got his start in commercials, and his future successes depended on the success of said commercials. It's perhaps a bit tricky to really consider Ernest a mascot in Ernest, not to be cute. But he was famous, and now he's gone. This show has always been about the advertising characters that were impossible to avoid, who no longer have a grip on pop culture, and we think it's fair to say that Ernest deserves to be in that category. But if you miss him enough, you can maybe find the 16-inch talking doll produced by Kenner in 89 if you look around online. Frankly, I'd rather have Chucky in my house, but that's just my opinion. Know what I mean? Hey, Vern, what y'all having for supper, huh? Rusty's Pizza. Your old buddy Ernest loves Rusty's Pizza. Rusty's Pizza is the freshest pizza on the planet. Mm, 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 mm. How's that salad? Vern, my, my, 